welcome Jeremy. Uh, so Jeremy Glassenberg is going to talk about uh, designing embedded platforms. And, and we kind of had this, uh, I don't know, shadow conference with Jeremy <laughs> on Thursday when we were preparing for this conference and having this speaker event. So uh, I'm really looking forward for Jeremy to closing this uh, track today. And one thing I want to emphasize before I leave, uh, let Jeremy take over, is that we have a closing, uh, really short closing uh, talk after this on stage one, and then we'll have the spatial chat uh, after party where you can actually mingle and network like you were in a real um, event like we did with Jeremy on Thursday. So, hey, Jeremy, put your mic on and do you have your slides ready? Is everything fine there? I know it's yeah. a little bit early, <laughs> so appreciate Wish. it. Uh, happy, happy to chat and uh, it's not too early over here. I guess it's early by, by engineering time, but if you're in uh, enterprise <laughs> software and have to work with sales folk, this uh, is yeah, that, fairly, fairly normal. Yeah, I have actually worked for a, a Scandinavian company, a Danish company for a year and a half. So uh, I'm kind of used to this, the, uh, the time zones as well. Yeah. And, and luckily you are not feeling the cold that we have here. So it's kind of just the time. <laughs> so anyway, take it over and lead us to the embedded integration platform. So many, so, so, so many words there. Alrighty, yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. Thank you all for putting up with me for the next uh, 25 minutes here. Um, so I'm just going to dive in because I uh, usually want to give a talk on this topic. It gets it gets fairly technical. Um, I'm going to get only you know semi technical today, um, but want to make sure that we we have time here. So yeah, as mentioned, we are going to be discussing uh, embedded integration frameworks. Which you know the term behind this is not anything too official. So people use different terms for it, but in its most basic level, this is about uh, building platforms such that third party partners can actually be part of your web interface. Uh, hence uh, the iframes. And I'm not going to apologize for the uh, pointlessly outdated Justin Timberlake reference, but yeah, now, now you know what we're getting into. So uh, a quick note about myself. Uh, basically, I've been working in, uh, API wor in APIs for well over 13 years now, specialized in product. I've worked in a range of industries in enterprise software and supply chain, education technology, even on drones. Um, I'm most well known for the box developer platform, but I've also worked on platforms like Atreachif. That's the uh, Scandinavian company I've worked for. And I've been a mentor and advisor to various startup accelerators, Heavybit, other enterprise accelerators, and various API focused companies. Um, Anywho, there's a particular topic that's been kind of near and dear to me in the world of APIs, and that's these embedded integration frameworks. Uh, and I really want to talk a little bit about the history of them alongside APIs so we can understand what's been happening, uh, where they are now, what's why this thing was a bit of a struggle over many years, where there's been failures, where there's been success, uh, and, and what to learn from all of this. Uh, so first of all, a little bit of context for us all on the, the API ecosystem in general, although there have been many talks today on, on the API economy. Um, but the basics that we know for this, con, for this, uh, for this session uh, is simply the history over the last 12, 13 years. Uh, basically, what was going on before the 2009 API craze? Uh, for those who don't remember that, basically in 2009, there was something that we call the API craze, where suddenly... Um, every software company, every web service decided they need to have some sort of an API. Uh, APIs just had suddenly gotten cool. And uh, during this time, we experienced many failures, um, but overall trending, things were successful. It was kind of a messy time. Everyone was launching an API without really a plan. But eventually, those companies that knew how to design APIs well, according to use cases, they demonstrate success, and that's why we have this you know, massive API economy today. But in that process, I noticed something, something special in the world of APIs that just didn't seem to make it through, that had fallen apart, especially during the start of that 2009 API craze when things were growing, but they were kind of messy. 
And uh, I'm going to ask show of hands and see if anyone remembers these things. Any of you remember uh, that from the screenshot at the top, this thing called uh, iGoogle? Anyone? Okay, I'm going to take this silence as a mostly no. Usually there's uh, one or two people in the audience who remember this thing. Uh, basically, Google had an alternative homepage, a customizable homepage. You could add a weather app, a calculator, a calendar, whatever you wanted. And third parties, partners were creating uh, apps to fit into this, you know, free flexible homepage. It was basically all about iframing to make a web page just highly customizable with a bunch of third party things. It's no longer around. Uh, and we have kind of a graveyard of this. These systems whereby third parties are actually in the interface itself, making the web kind of like an operating system that just didn't really make it. Many platform companies failed, but we've seen many successful companies attempt these and failed. Speaking of which, does anyone remember this thing in LinkedIn? Uh, LinkedIn used to have a system by which you could install a third party app and display something on your profile. It was a way of actually customizing your profile on LinkedIn. Uh, I worked at Box at the time we were a launch partner. There were only about half a dozen companies who ever integrated with LinkedIn on this thing um, before they quietly shut it down. And so what was going on here with these sort of failures? Uh, well, at the time, there was this idea of making the web look like and act like an operating system. Uh, in fact, there was a service that literally tried that. Uh, we called them the web tops. They were basically web pages that try to look like a desktop operating system with you know, a little launch button way of installing apps. Uh, and of course, you don't see anything really like this anymore. Uh, so this was going on around 2008, 2009, and really started a fizzle around 2010. It was basically happening is uh, if you look at something like this UOS, it seems like a neat concept. Was it really usable? Is it really what users were going to want? And that goes to something I always emphasize in the world of APIs, well, API product management in general. You may have heard this quote, if you build it, they will come. All right, it doesn't work in product management. And it, the APIs, platforms, they're no exception. It's not just, you know, if you build something naturally, people are going to come to it. There's more you have to do. Namely, you have to apply product process and plan according to use case. Design your APIs based on what developers are actually going to need. Uh, fun side fact here, but the movie where this quote comes from, it's called Field of Dreams. Uh, that's a screenshot on the left here. Long story short, what they build attracts the ghosts of these baseball players who actually took a bribe to throw a World Series. Uh, when you actually look back at that movie and think about it, they didn't even attract the right customers in that movie. Anywho, what I'm trying to get to here is this issue that those initial platforms didn't really think about use case. They didn't think what do the customers want and what do developers need. They were opening up these hooks, these places for third parties to be part of your interface, but in ways that didn't really make any sense. And unfortunately, in, you know, in API world, that, that happens sometimes as well. But the developers see it, they may get frustrated, and you know, they may forgive you later if you correct it. Uh, for these sort of integrations, these sort of platforms, iGoogle, LinkedIn, the customer saw it. It was right in the interface. It was high profile. It was visible. And so these companies, when they failed, they needed to shut these things down quietly. It was more painful for them. And many of these companies just shut down these platforms that didn't work out and didn't look back. They didn't want to understand exactly what went wrong or how to correct it until years later. And we're starting to finally see more success over the past few years with companies applying product mindset, product process, and actually um, uh, looking at what makes sense to users. That's what we're seeing in Gmail and Google Drive, these add-on features where you have integrations in the sidebar being part of the Compose interface, part of the email interface in a way that actually makes sense, stories that make sense. In the world of project management over a Trello, they figured out how to say, bring third party poker planning into a Trello card uh, and how to enable partners to be positioned in the right places, the places that make sense based on customer feedback. 
talk about that a little more before we get into the technologies that we're seeing in this space. Um, but first of all, the results now from the last few years are actually a lot of success. The Gmail and G Suite platform, Google Workspace platform program, it's gotten a lot of users who are making a good amount of money too. Uh, Twitch, Trello, Shopify, all these companies have in the last few years launched platforms. They've shown how it is building their businesses. They are able to get ecosystems going now by applying product process and looking at what makes sense for your customers before you actually plan to open things up in your interface for third parties. So the quick lessons learned here from the failures and modern successes are one, don't just drop iframes anywhere on your web page where they look cool. If you do that, you're going to look like someone who may have been cool in the 80s. And the 80s weren't cool. All right. Have real use cases. Figure out what is the user trying to do that they can't do in your system today and where they would really want someone else to come in and provide a solution. Speaking of which, in order to get those use cases, you need to have users. Um, I give a two and a half hour course on marketplace management. And so I can't dive into too much detail on this, but basically when you're allowing third parties into your interface, it becomes a marketplace problem. Uh, these partners are providing a solution to your existing customers. You are responsible for driving demand to those apps. And so the only way that's going to happen is if you already have users. That was a secret to all of these companies who were successful with their platforms. They had customers before they opened up other interface to third parties. And I've spoken with Shopify, Trello folk, folk over on the Gmail team. Uh, and they all said the same thing. They needed those users because they needed to literally watch as people use the service without these integrations and then try it hacking around the limitations. For Gmail, people were creating Chrome extensions to inject scripts into Gmail to make up for the lack of ability to customize Gmail. Shopify saw people trying to rebuild their entire interface so that they can customize it. And so they had all these scenarios showing that users were literally at, not just asking for it, they were trying to work around the limitations. And that was the evidence that there would be demand to bu build out a third-party ecosystem here. All right, now let's get into the fun stuff. The technologies behind these platforms, what's been working, what's not been working. I'm going to start with the most common and the oldest and the simplest, um, iframes. Also the most controversial. Uh, then we're going to get into cards. Uh, this is something you frequently see in Gmail and Slack. It's basically where we say you don't get to build whatever you want. You have to build within the restrictions of our interface. Um, and triggers, which is really just... Just thinking outside the box of what makes sense in your interface that maybe others haven't done that still allow third parties to be part of your system. So first and foremost, the elephant in the room really is the, the iframe. It is the most common. Uh, the most basic idea here is you're going to say that anyone can create their own other web page with JavaScript and everything else and just control everything. And then you're just giving them a space in your web page on your site where people can be embedded. Uh, simple. Flexible gives people a lot of power, uh, but we've seen the consequences. For one thing, many security teams will say, heck no. There are a lot of security consequences when you're letting someone else put code on your web page. Um, but security side, there's also an issue of performance. Many platforms of the past have confided in me that they actually had to shut things down because if their interface allowed for more than two or three third-party apps to be embedded on a single page, the whole page would just slow down. It would be a terrible experience. Um, and that was really a consequence of iframing where you just didn't know if a developer was doing something non-performant. Uh, so sometimes it's a performance issue. Sometimes it's a security issue. But iframes are still actually the most common solution because you're letting developers do what they need to do. Um, and also, it's easy. We've seen the bigger companies now, G Google with G Suite, they're being required to apply um, something called cards. Cards are basically where the platform says there are a few things you can have in the interface. Forms, inputs, certain kinds of displays. You can plop in an image here. You can display a video here. But we're not going to let you just throw in all the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that you want. We're going to give you a limited set of things that you can do to display something to the user. Um, there are many advantages to this besides security. 
To some companies, they go with cards just because the security team isn't going to allow anything else. Um, but other times, like in, say, Gmail's case, it's about the user experience. Uh, to enable Gmail, to enable third-party tools in, in Gmail for the web, sure, you can use a Chrome extension to inject a script. Um, but if you want to be able to integrate in Gmail mobile, and Gmail is used heavily in mobile, Gmail can never have enabled iframes. Just because iframing on mobile, it's just a really bad user experience. It's going to take up a lot of space, performances an issue. It's just it's, everything's exacerbated on mobile. So the only way Gmail could really open up the mobile app to third parties was through cards. Uh, Slack had a similar challenge. Slack is used heavily on mobile. So when developers wanted to open up iframing and Slack, besides security, they said, well, an iframe app isn't going to work well on mobile. So we're going to really have to go with cards. Uh, the problem with cards, though, is, you know, well, the, the benefits being, you know, mobile compatibility, simpler interfaces, consistent interfaces. You're kind of guiding developers to build apps that all kind of look and work in a similar way. So it's a nicer experience for your users. But it is really a pain for developers. And on many of these platforms, companies I advise, they get really excited. They can integrate and be part of the mobile experience. And they try making it work with cards, and they just give up. The reason being that cards, at least for now, are still limited in, in functionality, unfortunately. Um, well, the positive is I talk with all the teams working on cards. They're continuing to gather feedback, continuing to iterate, enable more function, enabling more functionality through cards to alleviate this. It's never going to give you the flexibility that iframes do, but over time they're hoping that it provides sufficient functionality so that developers can get the benefits of security, of mobile compatibility, if they build through cards. In the meantime, every once in a while, I see a company that's figured out how to handle this issue of trade-offs, of you know, the flexibility of the iframes versus the security and performance of the cards. Um, over at Intercom, I've seen, they just decided to combine the technologies. They encourage developers to use cards as much as possible. But if there's some scenario for them where cards just absolutely aren't going to work, the iframe is there. Uh, they can choose to trigger an iframe when necessary in their apps. And I find this is a reasonable solution if the issue is more performance and the user experience than security. You say, please try to use cards as much as possible. Okay, if you're 100% restricted, yeah, it's okay to occasionally let a user, you know, encounter, encounter the iframe. Um, finally, for that user experience, I'd like you to just think outside the box and realize that there's more than having cards and iframing. There are other ways to enable third parties to work with your interface. Uh, Google Docs had something where you could be part of the Google Docs menu and create a custom menu to, say, trigger a macro uh, or the equivalent of a macro or within Google Drive, be able to right-click on a file and send it to be signed with DocuSign, or send it to be converted, or send it through a third-party editor like Lucidchart. Um, this wasn't about iframing. All it was was having a little reference, kind of a link even, on your web page that would then open up a new window. Uh, so it's all about thinking about that user experience and saying, well, what other options are out there? There's a lot else going on. All right, in the time that we have left, I want to talk about you know, the business challenges, the market, the user experience, and thinking about what technologies do you want based on the user experience. But let's also talk about the developer ecosystem and those building apps. How do you really make this possible? Regardless of whether you're using iframes or cards, there are certain things you're just going to need uh, for the developer experience. First and foremost, when you enable an embedded framework, have APIs that correlate. Uh, in general, you want, if you're, say, iframing, to be able to call your regular API through your iframe. Although, it'll make sense to have some custom functionality that that iframed app or card app can call that may only work with the iframed app, some special APIs. Maybe an API that allows this restricted iframed app to interact with the rest of your interface. Say in Trello, when you're in the app do something that affects the card through your app. Um, so having particular APIs that correlate with the embed framework, that's a very common one, and that's really 101. 102, step two, is to provide a set of tools 
on top of your APIs, just like when you're providing in general SDKs on top of your APIs. For embedded frameworks, get to that JavaScript library. They all figure out you want to have some sort of JavaScript library so that the iframed app is an easy way to just make some function calls in their code to trigger other aspects of your platform's interface. In fact, many platforms have discovered that once you have something like this, they can actually host all the partner's code themselves as long as it's all running client-side. There's also the option of hosting stuff server-side, but we're not going to have time to talk about that um, in, in the presentation today. We'll just emphasize, get at least having that client-side JavaScript library on top of your you know, embedded framework-specific APIs. Um, and then next to that, 103. And I think Shopify really is the best at this. If you're allowing iframing, where people can you know, design things and code however they want, try to incentivize them to make their apps work in an interface that's consistent with your platform by giving them tools that call these APIs that have a pre-built interface so that developers can get their apps up and running faster, but also with an interface that you kind of want them to use, a UI that just kind of blends in more with your interface. And that's what UI components are about. They're basically snippets, samples, built on top of your APIs that are just reusable by your ecosystem. All right, trying to make sure we have enough time here. I think we're down just a couple of minutes. Um, I just want to make sure we have time for Q&A. So we've talked about the user experience, the technologies behind these sort of platforms. Um, one last note I have to emphasize in the short amount of time we have left here is consideration, of course, for security comes up all the time in APIs and there is a unique set of challenges when you're bringing third parties into your interface. This is one more reason why many platforms have fallen apart. Sometimes a security team just comes and says, we're not going to allow it. A few things to think about. One, if you are going to resort to iframing, and again, sometimes security says no to iframes, you may be able to negotiate by uh, asking for utilizing some HTML5 features to say we're going to provide restricted iframes. Hey, we might say that we're not going to allow apps to even run JavaScript at all when they're iframed in our system. You can set those sort of restrictions on iframes, and sometimes that can alleviate some security concerns. Also, when it comes to APIs behind this thing, it's not just about iframe issues. Um, it's that the APIs that you have may not be designed from a security standpoint to work well with these iframed embedded integrations. Uh, as an example, for Google Drive, if the integration is about right-clicking on one file and sending it to an image editor to edit the file, okay, what permissions should there be? Well, it should be allowed to view that file and overwrite that file. Do I need to be able to view everything in the user's Google Drive account just so that I can access that information about that one file? Well, some platforms are like that. They start out with the basic scope that says, hey, you're authenticating through our APIs. Oh, uh, this app needs write access. That means they need write access to everything in your account. As opposed to, hey, this thing's going to be living and operating one file at a time. Let's just say that when launched, you only get to work with that one file and not see everything else in the user's account. In the case of Trello for project management, maybe the app should only have access to the ticket that it's on. So you really have to think about scoping when it comes to these frameworks to say that an embed app maybe shouldn't have access to everything in the user's account. I just want to wrap up all of this with thinking ahead. And there are many of other technologies coming along. People are experimenting with cards and setting standards or working with something called AMP. Um, so there's many of, op many of other opportunities here beyond what I'm talking about today in terms of cards and iframes. And this experimentation is continuing. We've had this lull of these things not really working out for a long time. And now that they are, companies are experimenting. And we're seeing what works. We're seeing what doesn't work. But we're still learning. So I encourage you all, if you want to work with these platforms or build your own, see what's out there. Learn what else is out there. But experiment yourself. Keep dreaming of a future in which integrations will make sense. See, so we finally have Google Calendar and Gmail working together. Uh, thank you all for your time. Um, thank you all for putting up with me. I think we have a minute or two left if you have any questions. Thank you, Jeremy. It was a really 
interesting presentation from the point of view of like how APIs are not always used directly as APIs, but kind of through the SDKs and libraries. And and that that's always, of course, also confusing sometimes when you are, you know, training or talking about APIs and, and you have to kind of make it really clear which APIs you are talking about. Are you talking, you know, REST or GraphQL or are you talking about the, the uh, uh, programming language APIs? I've noticed that that is sometimes very confusing. But we have no questions so far uh, coming in for you. And actually, we are schedule-wise needing to move over to the closing words. So I hope that if you have any time to join Jeremy at that uh, after party in special chat, so you will come there too. But at least um, I hope that all of our audience is coming in there. And uh, I have the link.